And that is an incredibly big challenge. The similar problem is when you're melding other data elements, because there isn't a traditional QA process when you meld data. Because usually you do write your unit tests and do all this type of testing, but it only starts to look weird like that case with the nurse at the end once you have really put all your data together and you recognize like, wow, that, did, that doesn't look right. And so you need a whole different form and environment for actually testing and building these things. Any questions so far? So one of the critical things in this is building data products, you really need to think of this as a strategic progression of how you do this. And here's a, one of the products that we, we released earlier, and I will explain how to actually build this progression. This is uh, what we call talent match. So if you post a job on LinkedIn, shouldn't LinkedIn tell you where the best candidates are? Instead of you just waiting for candidates to come to you, you should be able to, they should be able to tell you where the candidates are. So this system, it's a great one because it started off originally as a SQL solution. We built it SQL. Then it was migrated to Hadoop. And then finally it sat on really customized technology. Why? Because it started off initially as a test. In fact, it started as a test. It was built on a laptop. And the way we found out that it was working so well was we turned it, that person, actually Monica, was out sick for a day. And when she was out sick, the sales guys called and said, hey, what the heck happened? We said, what do you mean, what the heck happened? And they said, well, the system's down. Said, no system's down. Everything's showing green across the monitoring board. And they said, no, no, it's down. It's cut, customers are really unhappy. And so we said, what did you just sell? <laughs> it turns out that they, were, they, were, they found such good value out of this that they were using it all the time. And so we realized, oh, wait, we got a good product. So then we said, OK, we need it to go faster. We need it to go faster. Well, how do we get it to go faster? We need to put it on Hadoop. We need to get it to scale. But then the jobs team comes to us and says, hey, you know what? This is such a great product. We think it needs to be right in the natural flow of posting a job. And it needs to be real time. I said, wow, real time. That's, that's, that's not easy. And they, they made a really good case for it. And we said, OK, great. So we had to really now build a very real time indexing system, all that stuff for that. What it turns out, fantastic, beautiful product. It works brilliantly for the people that are needing, and it brings in a substantial amount of revenue. So a good win. So what was required to do all of that? How did we do that? So this wasn't a product that we just woke up and said, ah, you know what, let's just do that. The first is it starts with the need to clean data. So that's a, actually one of the mocks of it. So you gotta start and you gotta take the data and you gotta clean it. And this is one of the most important things, and this is just a very LinkedIn version of it, but Guess how many variants of IBM there are on LinkedIn? Take a guess. No idea. That's not a good guess. <laughs> a thousand? Thousand. On that order. Turns out there's about, I think, between four and eight thousand variations of IBM. Why? Why so many variations? IBM, TJ Watson Lab, IBM Moscow, IBM Almaden, SPSS. All these variations. All the subsidiaries. All the subsidiaries. All everything. Got to map them. So you got to make that ontology very clean because you're talking about freeform text. And one of the most critical things that I can I can emphasize to you, if you try to clean and fix data on the back end, it is going to be a hundred times more expensive than trying to fix it on the front end. So how would you fix this on the front end? Suggestions. Just say suggest. Now here's the interesting thing. You might do a drop down. How long is that drop down? Well, it's just a fact. So do you mean, you could say, T, did you mean? You can do type ahead. These are all things that you might want to test to see what is giving you the right relevancy or giving the, making sure your data is clean. But the point of this, the primary thing, and I can't emphasize it enough, how critical cleaning data up front is. Because if you don't do this, everything else, you're wasting your time. It is totally useless. It is one of the most unsung parts of data. By the way, one of the things I should have emphasized in here is human augmentation is key. One of the things is that Amazon has a service called Mechanical Turk, and one of the things that you could do is you could submit very lightweight queries or tests to them. What's a test? You could say, hey, is this green or blue? And you can send it to a thousand people and you'll be able to tell if it's green or blue. So what do you do with that? Well, you could send out a whole bunch of things of the different variations of IBM and you say, Go give me the stock ticker symbol for this. Mm -hmm. Go give me the URL for this. 
Now you have an anchor point. Go give me the Wikipedia entry for this. Another anchor point. With all those anchor points, all of a sudden you've done a very, because it's so cheap, you're maybe paying a cent for this. So all of a sudden now you're doing, you can run this through, you know, hundreds of thousands of things. Do it for a million things, a cent. Maybe it takes a few days. That's fine. It's better than going and building two man years of technology to go do that. So using these very human lightweight tasks can make a very intractable problem or a very hard problem tractable in record time or at the very least help you figure out what technology you really need to build. So next part, get quick wins. Test the waters. And we talked a little bit about that with the ad system of just throwing out the people who may know results or the recommendations or even just doing something like when we had the this talent match product of the, the, uh, the recommendations, one of the things that we did is we said, okay, great, we've got this idea. How much, how broad is the interest in this? Well, one of the ways we could test that is we could wire it up to an email system and it will just email the user, uh, the person that posted the job, within 24 hours and say, hey, you know, we're trying this new product. Thought you might enjoy it. Are these good results or not? And very quickly we know, oh, they like them. That email test that I showed you, all those pictures, that was another done in a very lightweight way where it was just hooked up, it was sent internally to a bunch of people in the company and people said, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. We need to roll this out. How fast can we do it? So with lightweight tests, all of a sudden people get to know about it and you get to figure out what's right and what's wrong. By the way, critical that you test this out early. We built a, uh, one time we built this events recommendation thing, or not events, um, a group recommendation product. And we thought we'd test it out really lightweight way. What can go wrong with groups? What if you start re recommending uh, political groups okay. and religious groups? Okay. You want to make a person really unhappy? That's a good way to do it. So now all of a sudden you realize, oh my gosh, we didn't realize that there's these kind of groups. So then you say, okay, how are you going to take those out of the recommendation process? Now another interesting one is if you're going to recommend jobs for people, right? What's a really bad job to recommend for somebody? McDonald's. That's a bad one. I agree with that. Right? Recommend any job that they're less qualified for. So you say, hey, for you as an individual, here's a distribution of jobs that you might be that might be good for you. So we're going to recommend a job that is below on the you know little lo, lo, less on the left hand side of the distribution curve. Mm. That's not good from a user experience. They hate that. It also turns out. They hate it if you give them the, exactly the median. So you should only recommend jobs that are on the extremes, <laughs> even if those aren't good from a mathematical or analytical perspective. It is good from a user experience perspective. And that's the difference of taking data versus a product. That's a critical, critical part, is that you have to think about it as a product for the user. And that's actually what I was going to talk about here, which is, one of those things about exposing the data turns into problems, this is an example of where you can actually, well, this is just an example of that, but everything I just said, so I'll just go on from this. And once you get that, you can start building the increase the sophistication of the products, like turning it, putting richness, extra stuff. But the real beauty is then putting the jujitsu in there. And that's those things like Career Explorer, but also these things like Groups You Might Like, that's one of them, but also this product that's called Skills. And this is a fantastic one that exemplifies this because one of the things that you can do in this is, so if you go to linkedin.com slash skills, you can see this. And one of the things that's great about this product is you can, uh, well, how are you supposed to get the skills of a person? What's a skill? Well, you could go crawl everyone's profile and you could get a lightweight classifier and take out some information, but then how are you gonna actually figure out what, if this is the same skill? Well, one of the ways you do that, you send all the skills to Mechanical Turk and you say, find us the Wikipedia entry. So you get that. Then you can suddenly start saying, hey, here's all the professionals that are related, all the related companies, the growth. You can start doing all this stuff once you have that data in a categorized form. But it starts first with making sure the data is very, very clean. And then you start putting the pieces together. And as you put these pieces together, by the way, there's all sorts of gotchas. Cobalt. It's a type of code, it's a coding language, but it's also a metal, right? So you run into all these things where all of a sudden you go, wow, what are we gonna do from a product's perspective for that? 
And so you have to start thinking through all those things. And you only recognize that once you start interacting and playing with the data. So finally, some essential lessons. These are some of the big, what I call, lessons learned. The first one is setting expectations with the users is absolutely critical. And this isn't just true for web properties. So anyone know what that is? It's Ibo. It's a Sony dog. I don't know if anybody's called it, but you ever call an airline? What's the first thing that you get on an airline? IBR. You get an IBR system, right? And so you sit there and you say, agent, representative, operator, human, just somebody. You just try to get, you start pressing buttons, zero, 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 just trying to get to somebody. Now, here's the interesting thing. This IBO, lots and lots of very, very sophisticated technology. IVRs, also a lot of sophisticated technologies. You don't even actually press buttons anymore. They just try to listen to you. So both sophisticated, sophisticated technologies. Nobody ever looks at the IBO and says, stupid dog, and kicks it. Nobody ever calls one of these IVR systems and says, that was a lot of fun. Same time tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> Why such a difference? Why? Yeah, they're not the same technologies. I get that. But why such difference? Well, one is, it's a dog. It's a silly dog. If it walks and it falls over, what's the first thing you do? Oh, stupid dog. You put it right back up. You don't kick it. Stay down, right? You don't, no. And this one, you're just never happy. Right? It's just, it never, you cannot be happy in an IVR. Not if you're a normal human. <laughs> so what happens? It's a form factor. If they had made this into just a human ro robot, you'd be pissed at it. You'd be like, Ugh, this thing sucks. It can't even hold, hold my drink properly. So they did a brilliant job of setting the expectation of the user to bringing it down, really. And one of the great companies that does this is, and also a, this is not accessible, unfortunately, in Europe, is a company called Pandora. Uh, it's, uh, it's a music internet company. And one of the things that they do is they have a system that what, what it does is effectively you start with any song and it creates a whole playlist automatically for you. And one of the things that it does is it has this thumbs up, thumbs down feature. And when you give it thumbs up, it gives you this really nice tone message. And when you give you a thumbs down, it gives you another message. Now, here's the great thing it does. If you give it a thumbs down, it says something to the effect of, oh my gosh, so sorry we did that. We will never, ever do that again. Wow, shame on us. It kind of just, you know, it has that tone. You have a thumbs up, you're like, yay, glad you like it. That's super good. Thanks for telling us. Yippee, yippee, yippee. It's almost like the dog. You could put my lord after every one of their sentences. You'd be like, oh my gosh, we'll never do that again, my lord. Yes, we're so happy, my lord, that you like it. And so it set that expectation. Why is that critical? Because if you get a, the next result is bad music, you don't suddenly say, oh, the system is terrible, click, turn it off. What you say is, oh, yeah, you're right, you are stupid, but thanks for giving me another choice. You're giving a graceful bailout flow. You're allowing the user to say, hey, I fell over. Yes, put your right back up. In fact, you can take that to extreme because what does Pandora do with that data? It fixes itself. It starts to say, oh, that was probably a bad recommendation. We probably should fix ourselves. So you don't just do that in music. You can do that with recommending jobs, recommending books. What's something good that you should find next? You can do all of those things. But setting the expectation is critical because if you don't, the ability for a user to turn off your product is very, very high because you're taking a much bigger risk by putting out a data product than you are for a regular product. But they also the rewards are much greater. So be careful because too much data can freeze a user. And I'll give you a concrete example from my life. This is a product called Who Viewed My Profile on LinkedIn? And it has all sorts of great data in here. All this nice rich stuff. Now as data guys, this is the form I really like. This is a prototype. All fully clickable, full detail breakdown analysis. You click on it, it gives you drill downs, it's awesome. Guess what the CTR on this is? 